Legend the way, so dubs on the run. No turtle is safe when he's on the hunt. Witness the sack, just give it a rub. Cause who knows what you'll find? Toy hunting with dub. Hello everyone and welcome to Kid Dub Life episode two. Sorry for the very long wait. And I was able to meet Veronica Taylor and Eric Stewart at Ranger Stop recently. And I was able to have a press conference with that and I wanted to show you all this. And I just want to say this one shouldn't, video shouldn't give you motion sickness because Brian filmed it. Kaya, who are they? Who are they? Oh, they are the voice actors. Of what? Of. What are they? You just did a press conference with yeah, them? I did do a press conference with them. What's Veronica Taylor, the main voice? Veronica actor? Taylor is the main voice of Ash Ketchum from Pokemon, and Eric Stewart is the main voice of James and Brock from Pokemon. Veronica Taylor is also the voice of Sailor Pluto. Veronica Taylor is the voice of Sailor Pluto, and Eric Stewart is the voice of somebody from Yu-Gi-Oh. What was the unique about this event? It was really unique because we were the only people in the press conference room and I got to ask all the questions, which is really cool. The only people that spoke were Kaya and the two actors. Yep. Did you prep for that at all or did you just have to come up with questions on the fly? I was coming up with them, not me. I was coming up with the questions on the spot. My brain is working 50 miles per minute. So the folks will see this in dub life, but we wanted to get this out separately and uh, allow you to see Kaya's yep. first press conference. Yay! Kid Dub Life episode two. <laughs> We've got our friends here. Kaya, what would you like to ask them? It's the Kaya press conference. Yeah, so nice. Uh, thank you for joining us at our press conference. Yes. yes. Um, how long did you two, like how long ago did you start voice acting and like how'd you kind of get into it? Do you want to start? No. Okay, <laughs> I'll start. I, um, I started acting when I was five I did all the plays in my elementary school, my high school. I have a bachelor's in acting from college and I have a master's in acting from graduate school. I, um, I toured the United States with several acting companies with uh, Shakespeare and contemporary and children's theater. Um, I just happened to get an audition for an anime through an acting coach of mine. And because of that, I was cast in that and then they said, can you audition for this? And then things kind of um, went on from there. So ultimately, the short answer is training and luck. I started as a musician, um, and I got an offer to work in a recording studio in New York City, uh, and I thought that m they would be focusing on music. It turned out that they focused on casting and producing radio and TV commercials, mostly voiceovers. And so I learned all about the business from making coffee and, and getting scripts ready for clients to then working my way up to being a casting director and then finally being a producer and running the studio. Um, it was, uh, I stumbled into it. Uh, I, I loved doing, you know, I, was, I loved comedy. I was definitely a class clown in school and got in a lot of trouble for it, um, which is nice that I make a living doing that now. Um, <laughs> but uh, I learned a lot from the especially the woman that I worked for, Alice Whitfield. She's a genius when it comes to voice acting and coaching. Um, and I absorbed also, at, like Sponge, when I would give direction in casting sessions, uh, the feedback from those actors, uh, what they, how they interpreted the scripts, and um, just was paying attention to that. And then when I finally decided to go on the road as a musician, I contemplated what job I could have that would allow me to work from anywhere um, and that would support my my love of, of playing original music and voice acting made the most sense. I also do, do a lot of the production side. I'm a director and an engineer and a producer of, of a lot of the shows that you've watched. So, um, I, you know, jack of all trades that way. So yeah, I stumbled into it and now it's funny, I, I can't imagine what else I would do for, for a living. I've been doing it for close to 35 years now. Wow. Yeah. When both of you kind of start voice acting, because you both seem to kind of like stumble upon it, not really looking to, but you kind of ended up in it. When you first got cast for the role it, you had in Pokemon, how was your reaction to that? And like starting and voice acting and editing? Yeah, I think we were both working on Slayers actually before the auditions oh. for Pokemon. Mm -hmm. So we had been working together yep. on other things. Um, I think I didn't really know that much about Pokemon before we auditioned for it. So 
I, I loved what it looked like. I loved the roles that I was auditioning for and really hoped that I was able to get a part in it. But even though they said, oh, it's gonna go on TV, I really didn't believe that right. would be true. Right. So it was hard to get excited before. It wasn't one of those like, yes, type things like Ninja Turtles. Sure. We'd all heard of that before. So that was pretty exciting to be cast in it. Yeah. But um, yeah, I don't know. Did you know more about it? So I was brought in probably six months before to do a promo for an up and coming show called Pokemon. And all I had to say was like, coming soon, Pokemon. And it was a, I think there were about five or six people in the room. No one knew exactly how to pronounce the word. And I wasn't told what it was. And I just did these promos for it. And I thought that's kind of interesting. And then I was brought in to audition for the show. Um, I actually didn't get any roles in the very beginning, which is kind of funny. Uh, I replaced the other Brock, um, the, the, who never actually dubbed the show. Um, they decided to go with their second choice, which was kind of a backhanded compliment, but I t I'll take it. Total uh, compliment. Right? <laughs> Total compliment. Um, and then uh, James, I replaced a dear friend of mine who did, who did, I think, the first five or eight episodes, but he's a, um, a stage actor. He wanted to pursue that. And so at first it was a voice match, and then it became, I, I took on the craziness of James' laugh and the broad stuff that he does. Um, but every time we are asked to audition for anything, we're always told, this is gonna be huge, this is gonna be great, it's gonna be amazing. And as actors, we also know to say, yeah, we hear that a lot. <laughs> um, I can't tell you the amount of shows that I've actually been in that have gone nowhere. Right, so you don't go in thinking this is going to be a big deal. As the ripples of the promotion started to go on, once we started working on it, it was like, hmm, this seems to be kind of popular. I think it was the day that there was like Pokemon cereal in the in the, in the, in the grocery store that it was like, oh, okay, this is this is interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's very humbling to be part of such a big part of pop culture uh, history. Um, you know, if you're six or sixty, you know what you've heard of Pokemon, so that's kind of neat. But yeah, it, it was uh, it wasn't like yeah, I got cast in this huge show because it wasn't at that point. Yeah, I remember seeing the um, the big uh, what is it in Times Square, like oh, the, the marquee, right. and the big whatever for Pokemon the first movie. Right. And um, I remember standing under that with my family and getting a photo, like oh my god, we're yeah. here, we're in Times Square. Yeah. Really amazing. Well, we got to go to a red carpet, a red carpet uh, event of that screening yes. at the Ziegfeld, and in New York, yeah. which is a huge, was a very famous theater, and you know, that was not on my list of what I thought I was going to be doing. Yeah, you know, with my life. Yeah, bonus. When when you both were told to like voice act different Pokemon, what was your reaction to that, knowing you just really had to make noises and say your names? How did, were you able to use your voices to make them really come to life? Yeah, it was fun because, um, you know, most of the time we were brought in to do our human characters, right? And, and if a Pokemon made its first appearance in an episode, usually the director would look and, and, or listen to the original Japanese for a reference, right? To hear what the vocal sound was and say, oh, well, Eric is coming in today and that he probably could do something that sounds like that. So let's just assign, I never auditioned for a Pokemon. Um, it was more like, you're gonna be doing this one. Um, and one of the reasons why the, at least with the earlier Pokemon, they don't bark or chirp, they say parts of their name, was to educate those watching what, you, what their names were. So if you're saying Squirtle, Squirt, Squirt, Squirtle, you're probably gonna say, oh yeah, that's Squirtle. <laughs> right, um, and that was that was part of it. So um, I loved I loved doing all of that stuff because you're also challenged to interpret a uh, a statement or or script without real words. You know, I could give you an entire monologue by saying squirt squirt squirtle, and you probably would understand what kind of I was talking about. Whether I was in danger, whether I, you know, I, let's I'm having fun. You would get the the energy behind it. Um, and that, as an actor, that's a great challenge to be able to be able to do that. It's a lot of improv yeah. in a sense too. And uh, I think none of us questioned anything because we wanted to keep our jobs. Mm -hmm. And so you just say, I can do it. And then you figure out while you're in the middle of it, yep. how, to, how to make sense of it all. So I agree, yep. great challenge. And the water gun attack was totally me. It wasn't a sound effect. That's, <laughs> so <laughs> That's me doing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is probably a bit of a 
standard question, but what are your guys' favorite Pokemon? Mine's Pikachu, for Squirt sure. Squirtle. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, for you, when you were brought in to voice act as a male character, was that something that you were kind of curious about or had it like happened before? Yeah, I played Jim Hawkins on stage, actually. And, um, and the audience bought that I was a boy for that. Um, and that was only a couple, a couple years before I started doing Ash. So I didn't really think about that. As an actor, you just, you just play everything. Um, so I didn't, actually, I, I never questioned it. I just did my best. Um, they wanted us to match the original Japanese actors in our audition. So I was able to do that and combine it with something that I thought was kind of boyish. And I think also we would say in the first season, all of the voices kind of evolved mm -hmm. into what they would eventually be yep. as they were figuring out what it would be. Yeah, and, and, and you know one of the reasons why a young boy roles usually play by women is because their voices don't change, right? right. So, so, you know, if you cast a 10-year-old boy to play a 10-year-old boy, when that 10-year-old actor becomes a 30-year-old actor, he's probably not going to sound like a 10-year-old boy anymore. Right. But, uh, but I still do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's a I think it's a great voice for that character. I it's mean, so fun. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, so it, fun it's perfect. to do. It's perfect. Yeah. yeah, I did a lot of my gurgling sounds myself, too. Like yeah. Underwater and stuff. I think the show was really fun. We had so much action in mm -hmm. it that we were able to bring a lot to any of the roles we played that we didn't have the opportunity in other cartoons to do. Sure, that's the that's the freedom of voice acting, is that we can play anything we can sound like. Yeah. I'm, I'm surprised you played a male on stage, and I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm impressed that that, that that went over so well. Um, in our voice world, we can play anything. Yeah. You know, age-wise, that's what sex you are, stuff like that, anything you can sound like, which is like, you know, theater of the mind, you could just be anything. Yeah. That's really neat. Yeah. Plus, Treasure Island is a pretty awesome place. There yeah, you go. Jim Hawkins. There, for a lot of people, um, they got into either what it be cartoons or anime, just that general drawn animation category mm -hmm. by watching Pokemon growing up mm -hmm. or a little later on in their lives. So, and usually they do it in the English voices because that's what mainly is broadcast, is whether it be on TV or streaming services. So, yeah. how does it feel to know that you, your voices? were some of the first things that inspired or influenced others to get into those kinds of... Right, you're probably media. too young to remember like the you know, blockbuster video stores where the anime was in the back mm -hmm. corner mm -hmm. with like on, a, on like three shelves, right? If you wanted to find anime, it's like it was... You had to really you, dig yeah, for it. right? Uh, and I really, and I, I say this as being part of the show, but also, you know, I was not the, the, the main uh, force behind Pokemon, but Pokemon changed that. Pokemon made anime mainstream Saturday morning cartoons, right? It was accessible now. Every country thinks that Pokemon is theirs, right? France watched it, Germany watched it. They watched that dub. They didn't think of it as a Japanese anime dub. Most kids don't, didn't. Um, and it changed where anime was. It was no longer in the back corner of Blockbuster and Blockbuster goes out of business, whatever. It, it was everywhere. Um, so uh, I, just, I just think that it's, it's interesting the way we made that a sort of a general show and not specifically for this one genre was kind of a neat experiment. And it really, I think that it made a big difference. I think Pokemon made, made a big difference to that. It's really an honor to be part of something that that hit people so deeply. You know, and I think when, when you watch it when you were 10 and when you watch it when you're 30, you realize how much you've learned from the show. I know I have as a person and as an actor. I realize as the years go by how much more I learned when I was working on the show. And it's, it's really cool to be part of something like that. Mm -hmm. There's certainly things that... I watched when I was little that influenced where I am now. And it's it's really neat to be part of something that has influenced people, but then have the opportunity to come to a convention and talk to people about sure. that. That's the other thing, that we get to hear stories about people growing up, finding their best friends, all of that, mm -hmm. um, making their career choices, like you say, becoming an artist or a writer or an actor. And um, it's it's really amazing. Yeah. There's not, I don't have any, the words to fully express how 
incredible that is. We had we had great, you know, in the early days we had some of the best writers working mm -hmm. on that show. I mean, and, and also, it's not rocket science why that show is successful. All right, there there is something redeemable about every character. Um, you can connect to someone whether you like the good guy, the goofy bad guys, whatever. But under the underlying thing is there's always a moral yeah. to those without being preachy. Yeah, exactly. And 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 that makes a difference. Even when people are, oh, you know, it's it's too wholesome. It's do this. It's like, yeah, but see that registers with people because it's a good message. And when cartoons don't have that, they might have better sound effects and louder music and more action. They don't have the longevity of a show like Pokemon because they don't have the core moral that is always there. Right. Whether it's the bond of friendship or whether it's, you know, um, learning a lesson about not doing something wrong and, and uh, you know, getting uh, forgiveness or whatever it may be. Right. That's always been in there. And I think that that's, that's what made that show last so long. I think, too, um, what I learned somewhat recently, Satoshi Tajiri, he really loved bugs and he loved nature. And that's how, why he created this show. And there's something so elemental about it, so natural and mm -hmm. so natureful, that I think we can all identify with it wherever we live, whatever language we speak, mm -hmm. it speaks to us. So it is uh, pretty amazing. Yeah. So there, that, that was the interview. I hope that you all really enjoyed watching that. And for me, it was an incredible experience because a little over a year ago, um, I had never been to a con and never really thought I'd ever be able to go to a con. It kind of seems like a, a dream, really. So being able to, a, a year from that now, interview the, these people who were the voices and things that I had started watching as a kid and even still do now, it was a really incredible experience. I want to thank Brian and Mom and everybody who has helped me just kind of go and do these things and make this dream possible and i had a lot of fun doing it i hope that you all had fun watching it and i wanted to thank you all for watching and thank everybody who was a part of it too so i'm gonna wrap up the second episode of kid dove life with a dip in it at the end.